What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Got a special guest on today. She was actually facing the death penalty. She ended up going to federal prison, spent many years of her life there, but she can tell her story better than I can. Steph, tell the people who you are, where you're from, and talk a little bit about you. Hey, what's up, Chad? I'm good, man. Well, I'm originally from New York. Um, I mean, I just came home not too long ago, but um, that's it. I, I, you know, I grew up in New York. I was all over the place. You know, my parents moved us down to North Carolina. I was in Florida for a little while, but now I'm back in North Carolina. You know, upon my release, I came back to where my family was. Um, I mean, yeah, when I was younger, I mean, you know, things happen. You know, I got locked up. I did some time in prison, but I mean, I just got home. You know, things are going all right. I'm just trying to get it together. It's been a long time. You know, 10 years. I did time. You know, it's not that easy. So but I'm going all right. About, just, let's talk a little bit about the case. How old were you when you got arrested by the feds? So 2012. Um, how old was I? God, uh, 28. Yeah, 28. 28 years old. You're arrested by the feds. What kind of case was it? Um, it was actually, it was a double homicide. Yeah. Yeah. I want you to talk a little bit about the particulars. I mean, you're, you were married at the time, right? Yeah. Um, so actually the case, it happened, the actual situation happened back in 2004. Um, my ex-husband was involved in a gang, you know, he was in some street activity. Um, I really never was involved, but of course, you know, knowing after the fact, you kind of like being with him, you, you just hear things, um, you know, and it's part of the lifestyle, you know, when you're married to somebody, you just, you know, what's going on, but, um, here and there, but yeah. So back in 2004, um, he had gotten to a fight. It was actually a bar fight and it was between two guys and it wound up being two rival gangs. So initially, um, I guess that the people who were the heads just had said, look, you know, it's going to be, you know, we're not going to let them fight one-on-one. -on -one. It's going to be one against the other, you know, everybody. So, you know, I guess it, it wound up happening that it was like a green light on both sides because it just wound up being a street fight. Um, it turned really bad. It wound up that they just chased each other, I guess, for a long time. I mean, months, maybe even a year or so. I mean, there was times when I didn't even know what was going on. I'd be in the car sometimes and all of a sudden there would be gunshots behind me. And I'm like, what's going on? My, my ex-husband would say, go, go take off. And I'm like, what's happening? I, I was lost. I was like this. I was just like a piece in, in the puzzle that, and I, I was clueless as to what was going on. I mean, then all of a sudden, one day my ex-husband tells me, he says, Hey, listen, um, we're going to take a ride into the city. And I'm like, okay, I, I had a license. He never did. You know, you know, Steve, I got to stop guys. you for one. Let me stop you for one second, because I'm sure the viewers are going to be like, well, what gang was your husband in? Who was he beefing with? People want to know. Yeah. yeah, he was actually, um, at the time he was in Nieta and, um, the, it was the Latin Kings that he was, uh, beefing with. So it was a Nieta and a Latin King that wound up getting into a bar fight. And so, yeah. So he calls, tells me one day, he says, look, we're going to take a ride into the city. He said, we're going to, you know, take my brother. He said, we're going to follow him into the, uh, into the city in another car. And we did, I drove, he didn't have a license. So I was always a driver. You know, he always had had me driving just in case he never wanted to get in trouble, pulled over. And so we did, I drove into the city. Um, he said, let's go get something to eat. And we're going to go pick him up later on. Well, we went and picked him up later on. And when they got in the car, I had heard they were having a conversation and and I hate to say it, but I'm just going to be real and raw. You know, the what I heard them say was he said, when I blew his head off, his snot went all over my shirt. And it was like, I didn't even know what to say. Like my my whole entire like, you know, what do you do at that moment? You know what I'm saying? Like, what do you do? And and I was a young girl. So I started like, you know, I'm around my husband at the or the man that I was with at the time, you know, and I have these guys in the car and I'm, now I'm thinking to myself, damn, I'm in a really dangerous situation. And I didn't know what to do. So I mean, what do you do? You keep your mouth shut, you know? And um, so, I mean, nothing transpired from it. It was just more of a, um, you know, I, I was afraid. I was really, really afraid to do anything or move the wrong way because now I realize that, you know, I'm in a really, really bad situation with some really up people. And that was it. I mean, time passed and there was this big, huge federal bust. Um, it wound up being... God, probably in like 2011 or so. And I remember reading it in the newspaper and I said to my ex-husband, I said, damn, I said, look at all these guys. Well, the faces in the newspaper were actually people that were in his gang previously from years ago at that time when the, when the time when the murders had happened. And so 
the guys come to find out the guys who were initially in his gang wound up going to the other gang. Okay. They wound up from Nietes, they went to be Latin Kings and they like went to the other side. I don't know how that even works, how that even happens. Don't ask me how, because it blows my mind, but that's what they did. And so they wound up saying, Hey, to the feds, they said, Hey, listen, they were about to get busted for all these guns and drugs. They said, look, we got a case that you never solved. It was a cold case. So here we go. Boom. So now all of a sudden, I guess we were, my husband was under investigation. Well, May 22nd, the day after my birthday, 2012, the feds 5 a.m. came busting down my door. We were living in Florida and it was like they were like 20 deep. You know what I'm saying? All their military assault rifles. I mean, you're talking five o'clock in the morning. I'm in my underwear getting woken up and I'm like, what's going on? The feds came in, busted him, took him, asked me to come down for questioning down to the FBI building. And if that was it. I sat there. for. Let me ask you this. Real yeah. quick. So you guys are living in Florida. These murders happened in 2004. It's now 2012. You guys are still together. What's your life? We're going to get back to that in a second, but was yeah. your life different? Was he down there hustling in Florida? Uh, no, actually what had happened was, is he was always like a, I'm going to be honest with you. He was always a small time hustler. He didn't really ever do shit. He, he wasn't anything big. He just, he pretty much did what he did to just support whatever habits he had. Um, but he was involved in, in drugs here and there. Um, but he wound up, what happened was is when he came home, he was doing prison time way back in the day. And my family is, you know, they've always been in a union. We lived in New York. So my family had connections and they wound up getting him into the union. You know, he was in the laborers union. He had a really great job, get him out of the streets, do the right thing. My parents couldn't stand him, but they said, look, if you're going to be with my daughter, we want to get you something. At least you're going to be stable. They got him a job. Well, he had a really bad accident. He fell down an elevator shaft. He was going to get a $3 million settlement. Okay. They calculated based on what he would have done the rest of his life working. Had he not been able to work, he was about to get a settlement. So we moved down to Florida to get away from New York because of all, like just the lifestyle that was up, up in New York. We moved down there. He wasn't working at all. Um, he was waiting on his money. I was working. And I mean, that was it. He just, he was just laying around, not doing shit. You know, his life just turned into nothing. You know, all those years he was in the streets being a gangster. And then all of a sudden he turned into like this, you know, I don't know. He wasn't anything great, but. Now the police, the police run into your house where we were at military assault weapons, everything. And you jump up in your underwear. What's going on? I mean, nothing. I mean, I was terrified and my dog, I had, you know, um, a pit bull and at the time she was a puppy. And I mean, they had the guns at her and they said, look, you know, cause they were afraid. They don't know what they're going to do. I mean, they're looking like they said, we will shoot her if she even, if she tries to attack us. So I'm panicking. I'm like, what's going on. And the crazy part is that I'm just going it, to, it's like, you know, <laughs> my life flashed before my eyes because in my mind, in the back of my mind, I'm like, I knew, I just knew for some reason, something was always going to happen. Like I, it was always going to come back and, and bite them in the ass, you know, but it was crazy because <clears throat> there was many times where because of my relationship, but because of my marriage and it wasn't anything good. It was a really, really bad marriage. Um, it was, there was a lot of stuff. There was a lot of abuse. There was a lot of, it was very toxic. Um, but there was so many times in that marriage where I used to tell him like, you know, when he would be physically abusive with me, I would tell him, look, I, I just, I wanted to get away from him. And I would tell him, man, look, I'm calling the cops. I'm calling the police. It was like, it was like, so when they came and busted down my door, it was like a relief, but it was a fear at the same time. Cause I'm like, damn, I know what I know in the back of my mind and what I was afraid to speak up about. I know shit's about to go down for me, but at the same time, it was like, man, like I'm, I'm about to have this separation where it's going to set me free in a way, you know what I'm saying? Because of, of what I was living in, you know? So, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't anything good. The cops were in my house, man. They, they tore it apart. They busted down. They took him. They took me for questioning. Um, they sat me in that. I was in the FBI headquarters in Tampa for God, probably like six, seven hours. And when I tell you, it was like, they couldn't, I was so afraid to speak. They couldn't get a thing out of me. And, and I just, and I laugh when I think about it. Cause I'm like, you know, I used to watch first 48, 24, seven, you know, and you learn from the mistakes that other people make and you watch and people sit and, you know, they tell on themselves and you don't know what to do. And I'm like, I don't have a lawyer. I don't know what to say. I know about two, a double and not just one Chad, but a double homicide. You're talking to execution and you know, it's like execution style murders. And it's like, shit, I'm going down for the rest of my life. If, if I say anything to, to implicate myself in this situation. And I was terrified. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I was scared to death but they let me go after six hours because they couldn't get anything from me. I mean, I, when I tell you, I put up, I didn't say a word. I didn't. Cause I knew, I knew what the consequences would have been. They would lock me up and put me right in prison immediately. Sitting down there for six hours, they end up letting you go, but eventually you end up getting indicted, Oof. right? I did. So what happened was, is over the next, let me see, May, June, July, August, September, October, over the next seven months, um, 
they they kept coming at me, coming at me, questioning me, questioning me, like coming to my house, bothering my family. Um, you know, um, the grand jury um mandated my family to be at like a hearing and stuff like that. Like they're literally they were pressing us, and so I wound up hiring attorneys for my parents as like buffer attorneys for myself. And they, excuse me, the feds kept telling me, listen, all we want you to do is tell us who he is. Just tell us the, excuse me, confirm who he is in this situation. And I was, I was afraid. I didn't know what to do, you know? And so, and of course, wow. I don't want to just. They wanted you to confirm that he was the shooter? No, he wasn't the shooter. He was the orchestrator, my ex-husband. He never shot. He had other people do the dirty work. He was just like the, he just put the hit out, basically. That's what he did. Um, but they wanted me to confirm what I knew. They kept telling me, listen, we know you didn't have anything to do with it. We know you were just basically a minimal involvement, but we want you to just tell us who he is. They needed somebody to confirm that he was who he was. And I didn't do it. I was, you know, I didn't know what to do. I was so afraid. And I mean, I just sat there. So they let me go. Seven months later, um, they kept harassing me and they kept telling me, they said, listen, when we come for you, if you don't cooperate now, we're coming for you hard. We're going we're to make sure that you get exactly what he gets. And I didn't say nothing. I didn't say it. So December 5th, um, no, excuse me, December 4th, I'm up in New York now going to one of his hearings. I'm flying back and forth from Florida to New York because of course it's my husband. So what do I do? I'm torn between, I've been in a relationship with this man for 13 years and I'm also now, or well, excuse me, 10 years at the time. And, but also too, I'm trying to get away from it. So I don't know, I'm, I'm in that stuck of that, that um, it's like in limbo, you know what I'm saying? So I'm up, I'm up in New York at ready to go to a hearing on December 5th is his hearing. December 4th, my brother calls me. He's down in Florida watching my house. He said, Steph, the feds just tore the house apart. They tossed me around. They're looking for you. And I said, and I just knew it was over. I just said, look, I'm not, I'm not going on the run. Are you kidding me? I, I'm, I'm, I'm never going to jeopardize my life and my, you know, I, I have nothing to hide. So I said, look, I said, you just tell him where I am. Tell him where I am. Tell him my mom and dad's in New York. So December 5th, the next morning, about 5 a.m., the FBI came and knocked on the door gently this time. Um, they came with about 10 agents and they just said, you know, we need, it's time to go. You know, it, it's, you know, we got what we're looking for. So they did, they took me in and I went for my hearing that morning, December 5th, when he had his hearing, um, I was in the bullpen and he, I heard him next to me talking to somebody and I yelled, Hey, and he's like, what the are you doing here? Whatever. I go in for my hearing and my world dropped out from under me. So the prosecutor turns around and, you know, the judge says, you know, where does the government stand with the indictment of Mr. Carl? They said, we have a superseding indictment. Um, I had death by machine gun, um, murder, murder this. I mean, I had probably like six or seven um, different charges. And they said, uh, we are actively seeking lethal injection. And it was like, when you're, when you're in that moment, it's like, Chad, not only am I, am I fighting for my life in one instance with, with what I was married to and the life that I was trying to get away from, but I knew my world, all I said was like, I'm going to die. They're going to kill me. Like I'm, I'm going to die, you know? And, and it, it was like, I don't even know. I can't explain. There's no words for it. You know, when you feel that and you hear that. I mean, I read some of your case when you, when we first talked, so you're 28 years old and really, I mean, you're saying you got a minimal involvement or whatever, but you do end up with a, a bunch of time. Um, yeah. And they're talking about the death penalty originally, right? Cause back then that's kind of what they were doing. That was their thing at that time. Um, yeah. so you're facing the death penalty. You go back to the, you go back to jail, obviously. What are you thinking when you get back that night, your first night, if you can remember, you know, you, you just heard them talking about, they're going to maybe seek the death penalty. What are you thinking in your head? Man, you know, I was in, I was in, in Nassau County jail and, um, Nassau County jail is just, it's like the pit of hell. It's, it's just a concrete cell with old school clink, 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 clink doors. You know what I'm saying? When they locked those gates, when I got in there, when I tell you, I'm not even going to lie, Chad, I swear to God, it was like, I got on my knees and my knees must've been bloody the next day because I stayed on my face the whole night. And I was just begging God to just please spare my life. Like, and, and the crazy part was, is that, you know, after all those years, um, I'm in Florida, I'm, you know, my life is, my ex-husband was always doing what he did, but my life took a turn, you know, so we were two separate people. I was in, I was going to a church. I was involved in ministry. I was involved with a lot of youth. Um, you know, my life was just different. I was a production, you know, productive member of society. I always worked. I'm a paralegal. So my life was very different. And so I'm on my knees in this cell and I'm like, God, like, you know, I know I knew what I knew and I knew it was wrong to, you know, because I thought about the victims and I thought about these kids and, you know, they were young, they were peewee gang members. And, you know, the, it crushed my soul to, to even think about this, but I'm on my knees and I'm like, God, please, like, 
just make this right. Like I, I really, really thought Chad that they were going to kill me. Like when I heard lethal injection, I really was like, you know, I didn't know what to think from that. I really, I thought I was going to die. I might, I knew my life was over in that instance. Like, and if God didn't change it, it was never going to be changed. I knew it was, I just thought about that. It was over. Like it was going to be the end for me. I mean, that's, that's a tough pill to swallow. Right. So, you know, tell the people what the government alleged you did. Like, what did they specifically allege that Stephanie was doing? Okay, so they basically, the they had cooperating informants. And um, they, the reason why, they couldn't get me for something. They did? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There was a few of them. Um, but they couldn't get me for so long because they didn't have a story to collaborate, to put me in it. They knew that I was basically like an innocent driver in the situation, but they never had me as actually involved. So... As time's going on and I'm in pretrial, my attorney's coming back and saying, hey, listen, so we have the co cooperating informants um, informing the, the prosecutor that, you know, you were there for the planning. OK, so you were there. You were you were at the gang meeting for the planning. And then all of a sudden it comes up and said, oh, well, you took jewelry and pawned jewelry for the from the victims. And all these things are coming up. And I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, you know, they literally and all it takes and I've done my research over the years and, and I didn't know this at first. And I'm like, no, like I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't understand how they could say stuff like that. But when I started doing my research, I said, well, all it takes is two or more informants to actually put a solid case on you from the FBI, from the Fed. So if you have two cooperating informants collaborating with the same story, it's a no brainer. So they're saying let me, that Steph, I let me stop you for a second, because there might be some young girl that's caught up in the same type of situation you were caught up in, right? She's watching today. I want people to understand that, you know, really what you did was allegedly you were the driver on the day that these people end up dead, right? You're just yeah. there for the planning. Maybe I'm not saying where it was at, but maybe it was at your house and you just happened to be home. And now all of a sudden yeah. they got this conspiracy that they tie you in. And now you're facing the death penalty because you were there for the planning, allegedly. You drove the car on the day. And then after they yeah. took some jewelry, you might have pawned it for petty ass money and now you know you're facing lethal injection so yeah. some young girl that's watching right now she thinks that gang life is cool and whatever she's doing look you could be like you and eventually things do work out for you but i want them to know what the situation is and how the feds work but go ahead i'm sorry for interrupting you but i just want people to know that no yeah it's let me tell you something you know you you think it's you know, it's fun when you're young and it's fun when you're in it. And I, and I used to tell a lot of the girls in, in prison, you know, when I was there, I used to look at them because they were younger than me. And I used to try and school them and tell them, listen, you know, they, they're running around, you know, flashing their flags and their gang signs and their colors. And I look at them and I'm like, you know, you're doing petty little time on some drug charges right now. But when you're facing the death penalty, when you're part of something that you don't even realize is bigger than you or that is, is so heinous and detrimental because you could have somebody that you're with or your friend let's say me and you were chilling and hanging out i don't know that you came and just came and committed a murder i don't know that you just did a robbery at a bank i don't know but i'm driving with you in the car and i'm chilling and the feds pull you over and guess what i'm in conspiracy because now i'm driving you around and you just left a crime so you know these a lot of, i tell you know these young girls i swear to god if you if you take anything from this today you know i'm going to tell you right now i lost a lot of time in my life i I lost a lot and I thank God that I only got what I got. And when I tell you it was only by a miracle because mine went from the death penalty to life to 45 years to 35 years to no less than 20 at my plea. It was, it was, it was um, when my plea was zero to life, but the prosecution was recommending no less than 20 with lifetime probation. That was it. That's what I went to sentencing for. And so, you know, there was no chance. It was like, I had no chance. It was only by a miracle. And no cooperation. Let me just make that plain and clear. Um, but these girls, like I, I tell them, man, listen, if you're if you could take anything from this today, what would I say, just please like be mindful that you think it's all good now and you think these people are are great and they're special and you may have nobody at home and this may be your family. But I want to tell you something, you know, when you when shit does hit the fan and you do get locked up or something does happen, you lose everything. You lose your life. You lose everything around you. You have nothing. And prison is not fun. You are lonely. It is the, it was the most lonely and, and painful time of my life. I, I look at my mom and dad and I thank God they're still alive, but I would watch them on video visits. Um, cause you know, we had the core links and in, in federal prison and I would watch them on these video visits and I would see, and I'm like, over the years they've aged. And I look and I, I used to beg God, please, God, just let me get home. Let nothing happen to them. But I looked, my brother had children. My, my, my 
my family, my grandmother, I come home, she's 90 something years old. And she just kept telling me, I'm, I'm, I'm hanging on until you get home just so you can make it. Like you lose everything. I come home, I'm 38 years old. I came home and guess what? I have nothing. I have zero. Like, you know, you lose it all. And if you even make it out like I did with the amount of time that I had by the grace of God, even if you make it out, let me tell you something. It is one of the hardest journeys to get back on your feet at all. But even if you don't, you're going to sit in the prison for the rest of your life over something that somebody else did that you thought was cool at the time, but it really wasn't. Talk about this real quick then, Steph. You end up getting, tell, what did, what did you end up getting sentenced to originally? What's your, what's your sentence on that day of sentencing? My sentence was 144 months. So when I went to sentencing, the judge, um, it was funny because you had all of the Latin kings in the courtroom, of course, on one side, and you've got the family members on one side, and you've got them coming up and talking about against you that you're a monster. I mean, they, they literally, the mothers got up and I was mortified. They got up and they said, listen, you're a monster. You deserve to spend the rest of your life in prison. We wish you would have gotten the death penalty. So they're trying to persuade the judge to sentence me to a long time. And you know, when I was sentenced, the judge just looked and she said, you know what? And, and it was, I don't even know why she said this or how, but she looked at them and she said, sit down. She said, we don't even want to hear nothing. She said, I respect the mother and, and the parents in this aspect. She said, but don't think for one second, I'm not fooled on what's other side, on the other side of that courtroom. She said, Miss, and at the time I was Miss Cabral, because I was married. She said, Miss Cabral had nothing to do, you know, in depth with this crime. She said, and I fully believe that because of all the circumstances of the case. She said, however, I'm going to sentence you to 12 years. Well, the prosecutor lost her mind. Like she was furious. She wanted a conviction. It was an election year. 2012 was an election year. So, you know, this is a cold case. This is a big case for them. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? This is going on her resume. So she wanted me. She wanted me hard. And when the judge sentenced me, she sentenced me to 12 years. And she said 144 months. She sentenced me for, because they hit me with conspiracy to commit Hobbs Act robbery because it was a robbery and, and then essentially an execution. So they robbed them, they kidnapped them, and they executed them. Um, but they hit me with conspiracy to commit Hobbs Act robbery, and then they enhanced it with a 924 using and carrying gun charge because at the time, the Supreme Court, um, which they changed, of course, you know, um, but at the time, the Supreme Court was allowed to hit you with a conspiracy plus a using and carrying gun charge, even if you didn't use or carry. So that's what hit me with the 12 years. I got a five-year and then, a, uh, excuse me, a seven-year and then a five-year on top of that for the gun charge. But when they hit me with 12, it was like, it was it it was a good thing, but it was a scary thing for me. That's sad that you can sit here and say twelve years was a good thing, but the reason it was a good thing is because it wasn't a life sentence. It wasn't twenty. It wasn't thirty. Yeah. It wasn't forty. And you know, it gives you a chance to get out as you are, and you know, a second chance to to get your life back. I want to talk. Yeah. A little, I do want to talk a little bit about federal prison for women, right? Yeah. So you're you know you're still a young young lady. You're walking into federal prison. What's it like to walk into federal prison in a woman's prison? Well, the first night they put me in the shoe because of course they do the medical testing. So I'm walking in and I'm like, oh my God, they put me in the cell and I'm terrified, you know? Um, all I thought was, you know, I'm going to prison with people who are doing the rest of their life in prison. I heard stories, I'm with lifers. Oh my God, they're going to slit my throat. I'm just this little tiny thing. Like at the time I was, I was, you know, petite, I was smaller. Um, I wasn't eating because of everything I was going through. So I was, I weighed nothing. So I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, what are they going to do to me? Um, I mean, it was very scary for me at first. Um, it was, it was, it was terrifying because I didn't know what to, you know, what I was going to face. And of course, you know, you walk in and you got all the girls. I mean, they're talking about, hey, fresh meat, you know, and you're like, oh shit, I'm going down. You know, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, you got your, you, you got, you got people that are in there. You know, they're trying to antagonize you. They're trying to make you scared. You know, they're trying to make you afraid. Um, but of course, then, you know, um, as soon as they find out, oh, you know, I was pegged the murderer my whole time while I was incarcerated. Everybody called me the murderer because, of course, you know, right away they read about two murders and they're like, oh, you're a murderer. So after a little while, they kind of like it was more of like they, they, they didn't bother me as much. You know, I mean, I was good after a little while, but I was terrified. I was scared. So you go in there, you're a little bit worried. You're still you're young, you, you know, small chick. You're, I mean, you're still relatively uh, I seen you on Facebook running, jogging. So obviously you still work out and everything. But. You, you know, you, I want to know what, it, you know, the viewers want to know. I want to know, too. You go in there and, you know, they're like fresh meat or whatever. And you talked earlier about like gang colors and are, are they kind of like gang affiliated in the in a female's federal prison? Some of them are. Um, they are. Yeah. You have your your groups. <clears throat> it's still very segregated. I'm sure, you know, just like the men's prison. Um, You know, it's 
you got your groups, you know, the Latins hang out with the Latins, you know, you've got, um, you have, you know, of course you got your Mexican gangs, you got like the Sorenos, you have like, you know, they all, they kind of group together. They come from, um, you got, you've got your Latin Queens, you know, it depends on where they're coming from, but they don't really rep as much. It's more of like, I think they just do it for uh, more of like clout, you know what I'm saying? To kind of like build their, 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 I don't know what you want to say, like their prison, you know what I'm saying? Um, resume up or whatever you want to call it. But some of them do though, you know, there's, there's, you know, you got your fights in there. Um, you got your, you know, I've seen people get sliced in there. I've seen people get their asses whooped in there. You know, I've, I've seen, you know, we call it the SWAT team used to have to come in with the guns and the, you know, the, to hear the gas or whatever the mace and all that stuff whatever those things are but yeah i mean it can get pretty violent in there you know but you do have your females that do rep in there so you're you're an italian girl from the city right from new york who do you i mean do you click up with the white chicks do you click up with the latin girls who do you click up with you know i've always been so i'm i'm three i'm italian mohawk indian and i'm brazilian so i have three races inside of me um i'm gonna be honest with you i've never really and i hate to say it i don't mean to be like this but i never really was with um italians or like caucasians i've, I've always been more like with the latins or like the african-american like that's always who i've been i've always gravitated to and it's just been very comfortable for me because i'm i'm not from a, a family who judges so I'm very like, I don't know, I've always been with them. Like, you know, a lot of the Caucasian girls, let's say in prison, were a lot of the, they use drugs a lot. You know what I'm saying? They were a lot of like, they were the pill heads. They like to do, you get, they got meth in there. They got a lot of different drugs. So it was never really something that I was into. I'm not really, you know what I'm saying? I like to have my drinks here and there, but I was never really a drug addict. If I did I anything, I like to smoke weed. That was it, you know, in my youth. But now I, I pretty much... I was pretty much with like, you know, the Latins, the Africans. I, I clicked up with, I was just me. I didn't claim to be anybody else but me. So either you take it or leave it. After a while, they started realizing that you can't conform me and make me what you want me to be. I came in here alone and I'm leaving alone. So this is me. You know what I mean? So I never really, I never really became anybody else around me. You know, I just was what, I was just cool with everybody. You talk about segregated, right? I mean, in the men's prisons that I've been in, there's a white TV, there's a black TV, there's a Mexican TV. Is it like that in the female federal prisons? Uh, to a degree, yes. Uh, it, you know, depending on what prison you're in, they're more late. Some of them are more laid back. Um, but you do, you have your TVs where, you know, pretty much, I mean, it just depends on who's running it. You know what I mean? Like if you got somebody who's really, because, you know, you have your rec orderly or your unit orderly that's running the TVs. But depending on where it is. But if it's somebody who's just real neutral and chill, then they will sometimes give a little bit of leeway. But yeah, pretty much you got your Spanish TV, you got your, you know, your TV where, you know, you got your African American where, you know, they play pretty much BET and all that stuff. Then you got your Caucasian where they're playing, you know, Lifetime and all types of, you know what I mean? The the, the white girl girly stuff. <laughs> I mean, it is what it is, you know? Me, I was never a TV watcher. I like to watch football. I was a sports girl. So I watched my sports and then I went out inside and worked out, you know? Let me ask you this. The white chicks, right? I mean, are they, are they racist in there? Are the blacks racist? Are the are the Spanish girls like, oh, them white girls, I don't like none of them. Yeah. How's it work? Yeah. So you got your Caucasians, you got your white girls that, um, you know, a, a lot of them are, because of course, a lot of them have men that are locked up there. So uh, in other prisons. So a lot of them are from like, um, you know, Aryan nation, like it, they ride with whatever their, their men are. So the white girls, you know, it, it's more of an undercover thing. It's not so, they'll blatantly, you know, you'll see that they're, they'll talk to people, but when it comes to who their people are, they don't really associate, you know what I'm saying? Out of that box. So yeah, you got your white girls who are like a lot of them Aryan nation. Um, you'll see them like some of them got their little swastikas stickers on their arms and stuff like that. And all the little, whatever gang tattoos you got your, you know, your Mexicans, a lot of the Mexicans girls are, um, you know, if they're, their men were like I said, the Soreños or they come from a lot of the, where I was at Tallahassee, a lot of the girls came from uh, Dublin, California. So you had a lot of them out there um, who had come there. But yeah, they they pretty much stayed, a, they didn't really, we, we would get involved with like sports and just basic stuff because if we were on a league or something like that. But when it came to hanging out, they didn't hang out with nobody pretty much but their peoples. You ever get in any fights in there yourself? Uh, no, I didn't actually. I, I was very, very close though, many times. But you know what really stopped me? Um, you know, you know, a lot of the and we call them doms or studs, you know, like the, the girl boys or whatever, you know, that we call them in the in the in the female prison. But 
a lot of them had my back because I was just one of those just cool chicks that didn't bother nobody. So a lot of the girls, they pretty much. Um, I got to stop you because some people are like, man, does she have like a stud in there? I mean, people. Are no, oh, actually, no, I didn't. Um, It's funny that you say that, though, because the whole time I never did. Um, But uh, towards the end, I did meet somebody. Yes. And there it's somebody very uh, significant in my life. And she's still in my life. Yes. It's funny because I never, ever thought I would. But yeah, I did. I, I met somebody and, you know, she's it's definitely she's still part of my life. Yes. <laughs> it's not it's not Sarah Blair, is it? No. You ever run into no. Sarah? Sarah, you know, I'm really terrible with names. I would have to see her face. I have to send you a picture. I think I might have one. But anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, so you never really got in a fight in there, but you can swing them things if you got to, right? Oh, yeah. Listen, I grew up doing martial arts. I mean, this is just what it is. Like, um, I got two brothers. I'm the only girl. Um, But it's funny because, you know, I worked out all the time. So my strength, I'm a very strong person, but I'm quiet and I'm very laid back. You know, I'm the type of person where... You know, my mother always said, watch out for the quiet ones. And that's me. I'm real like, I'm real laid back. You got to really push me to bring me to a place um, where I'll explode. But somebody once told me, they said, Stephanie, you're like a volcano. They said, you know, you lie dormant, but when you erupt, you can do damage. And, you know, I always thought about that in the back of my head with all the pain that I've been through, with all the abuse, with everything I went through, I stuffed for so many years, Chad. So if something, if I really would have gotten into a fight or I popped off, I thought to myself, like, I would have just blacked out. And God forbid, all I thought was from day one, my attorney always told me, listen to me, your behavior and your history is going to reflect on what happens at the end of your sentence. Remember that. And it, I kept it in my mind when they called me a murderer, when they, when I tell you, I mean, people pushed me to the max, they would push me, they would push me. And a lot of the studs or a lot of the, you know, who are my friends, they'd be like, yo, leave stuff. They call me, they call me little Steph, leave little Steph alone. Like leave her alone, man. You know, you don't know what she's capable of, leave her alone. But I grew up doing martial arts. You know, we did Taekwondo growing up, you know, you know, I did like, I'm into kickboxing. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm I'm not like, I'm small, but you push me and I'll f the world up. And that's just the reality of it. You know, you just don't know that. People don't know that side of me. So I tried to just keep it peace. I tried to keep it cool because I never want to lose my good time, man. In the feds, you lose your good time. And I was afraid that I didn't want to miss another day in my life than I was already missing, you know? Hey, I mean, that's, that's a jewel right there. You wanted to get out of prison. I respect that. Yeah. <clears throat> so, we, you know, female prison, sometimes people think that, you know, they're just running around talking shit, but they are fighting. What's some of the worst shit that you've seen in a female prison? I think some of these younger women need to hear that. Yeah. So I'll never forget, man. I tell the story to people who ask me. Um, we were I was in the chow hall one day and, you know, Wednesday's burger day. Right. So you're going, you're in line. And all of a sudden there's this girl that walks in and she got a razor and she just slices her girlfriend's face wide open. And you're like, what the f you're like, what's going on? I mean, she just, and, and because her girlfriend was cheating on her with somebody else and her girlfriend, I, I want to say she had like a life sentence or something. Her girlfriend had many, many years in prison. So it really didn't matter to her. And it was like, boom, all of a sudden, here comes the police, here comes the SWAT, here comes everything. And then they're like, you know, whatever the, it, it was just crazy. Um, you know, it, it was, it was nasty. It was really nasty. There was another one. Um, although, I mean, this is a funny story, but I was, I'll never forget this either. I'm a medical and here comes this girl and she comes out of medical and she, boom she lays her girlfriend out right in the middle of medical and everybody's just in there like what she's all you hear is bitch you gave me herpes <laughs> i mean when i tell you i mean crazy and then there was another one where we were on the rec yard and i don't even know these two females got into a fight and they were just arguing all day boom and they wound up getting into a fight and when i tell you it was like you you've never seen it was like when i tell you it was like a crowd in new york city and it just wound up being like 60 people boom 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 just knocking it out just right on the rec yard and here comes all the police digging them apart everyone's going to shoot there must have been like 15 people that went to shoot from it you know just that got caught because then everybody's running if i had a video camera forget about it you know i mean it's, it's some of the things like like oh there's another one they used to love the lock in the sock oh my god so i'd be like you'd be laying in bed and sudden, people with locks in a sock in there Oh my God. Yes. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yes. These, listen, these girls are ruthless. Like you don't even know, you know what it is? They're not, they're not thinking. They're not thinking like they don't care. They're, they're angry. They're, they're frustrated. They had, they had terrible lives and now they're in prison and this is their life. So they're like, you know, of course. And there was one that was, I'll never forget in one of my unit. Um, there was a girl that it was like two rival gangs. I don't remember what it was. It was a Mexican girl and a white girl. And some girl, I mean, all you heard in the middle of the night was boom, boom. And you heard like, like a smashing. And I can't describe it. I mean, you know it, but her face was being smashed in with a lock. And it was like. Who was getting hit with the lock? The white chick? 
Yeah. Yeah. The Mexican girl just busted her and she just kept busting her. And it was like, you know, we woke up. I mean, everybody, you know, of course, and the CEOs. So where I was, the CEOs lock it and they sit there, they lock you in and they're in their office. So nobody hears nothing. You got to really bang on that door. So here comes, you know, of course, people are starting to, it's an uproar. People are banging on the door and this girl's face is just bloody and smashed. And it was disgusting. It was real nasty. What about the cops? Do the cops, are they nasty towards you guys? Uh, some of them were, yeah. Some There was a lot of racism with the, with the police in there. Um, you know, if it's, it depended on what prison you were in, you know, um, again, I was in four different ones. So the, the police were real racist. Um, the, the females were real hard on you. You know, I mean, if you're, especially if you're not, if you're somebody who takes care of yourself, you know, you work out, you know, you're, you look somewhat decent. A lot of the female officers are really, um, real tough on you. The officers, the men, the men are pigs. The men are disgusting. They're, Stop. they are the women, the women seals. What are they jealous of you because you're working out? You look good. Is, is that what it is? I don't, you know, at first it's like in your mind, you think to yourself like, damn, what did I do to you? You know, cause I'm just here doing, you're free. Like I'm locked up. What are you? But yeah, I mean, I mean, a lot of people put it to me plainly, like, look, Steph, like, you know, this one's got a problem with you because they look at you like, you know, you take care of yourself. You look good. They're coming to work and they're working in a prison and they look like trash and you're here every day working out, taking care of yourself and, and doing the right thing. And, and in my mind, I couldn't wrap my mind around it. Cause I'm like, you're free. You're free. What do you like? What, like, what's your problem with me? You know, like, so everything you do, like they want to cause problems with you. You know how many times they try to put like, like they would just start investigations on you or they would try and get you in trouble or they try and like just little stuff, man. I had to fight my way through, through, you know, just in different ways through my incarceration. And it was just exhausting, you know, just exhausting. They don't leave you alone. You talked about the men. What are the men cops like? So, you know, a lot of them are just pigs. Um, not every single one of them. Some of them are decent. You know, some of them you got like just good guys who are just like, you know, they got daughters. They, they look at you like men, like, you know, they try and school you and, you know, encourage you and lift you up. And, and a lot of them did. Um, a lot of the old school guys that were there a long time, but you got these young cats that used to come in and, you know, they're surrounded by women. So they're looking at you like, you know, you're a piece of meat. And there's this one time, um, I'll never forget. I was walking down the compound when I was in Florida and this one officer, he just comes up and he's like, come here. And, you know, the, it was um the 10 minute move just ended. So I was literally like right on the verge of making it into the unit and there was nobody on the compound. And he said, come here. And now he was always very flirtatious with me, but I don't play that. You know what I'm saying? Like you teach people how to treat you. One thing I'm not is I'm not a whore and I'm not just going to put myself out there, especially I'm not thirsty. You know what I mean? So I'm not going to do that. And so he never, he always would like pursue me. So I'm looking at him and you know, a lot of girls were like, listen, just be careful with him because if he doesn't get what he wants, he's going to try and, you know, he's going to try and he may be manipulative in certain ways. So he said, come over here. So I'm, I said, you know, yes, sir. I did it in a respectful way. And he just looked at me and, and he came face to face him and he looked me up and down. And he said, I just wanted a closer look. He said, I'm gonna come and find you later. And that was it. It was like, my whole shit was just like, because you know, you there, there's women that I know that were in there. I know women that were in prison. I know officers that, that not only just had consensual because there was some that did, but there were women that were actually and you know, it's, it's a little scary because they have power. And at the end of the day, the staff is taught to believe staff. 